Hello, hello. I feel like it's been a while. This is going to be my guide for patch 10.2, um, season 3. And just going to give myself some, some sort of credibility for the people that don't know who I am. I'm currently the highest travel hunter in Shuffle. And then historically speaking, I am the highest hunter in Shuffle, at least on EU. Um, I am the highest twos player of all time. And then in threes, I have a couple characters up here as the highest the survival hunter in threes. Just to s some sort of credibility if you don't know uh, who I am. So yeah, I actually have an add-on that I got just to help me uh, keep a little bit more organized. So I'm going to be talking about the, the talents first, just to go over some kind of basic things. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from last guide. I'm not going to go over absolutely every single talent because... I feel like talking about talents that aren't picked anyway is kind of pointless. So, in general, this will be the build that you will play for the most part. However, there are going to be some matchups where you won't get that much value from, from Spearhead. Now, that's going to be if you're playing against some melee, or maybe you're on a really, really small map, like Lordaeron, or maybe Hookpoint, something like that. Then you kind of have two options. Either you can go Spear Focus, so you get 10% more Mongus by damage. And then you can get Ferocity, which is 10% more pet damage. This overall will give you, you know, maybe just like about 4% more damage overall than playing this build. So it's definitely something that you can do if you feel like you're not ga gaining that much value from Spearhead. Just know that these talent points together, um, if you don't count the damage you will get from Spearhead, which is not that much, is around 4% more damage. The other thing that you can do is go Ruthless Mordor with Fury of the Eagle, so you get like a little bit more damage, well kind of a lot more damage if they're below 65%. I think the issue with this talent though is it can be kind of awkward to use because then you only really gain value from this talent if they are below 65%, which sometimes can be kind of tricky to, to happen. So I feel like it's not that good. It's not bad, but it's very situationally good. Um, May you're gonna be into some teams where the AoE damage is gonna be like off the charts, or maybe you're playing against, I don't know, something like Warrior DK in Shuffle or some something like that, uh, where you won't be the kill target and you have like a chance to fully get like a Fury of the Eagle off. Maybe you're playing with like a Mage or a Warlock or something. Then I think this could add a little bit more damage to the overall DPS than playing these two talents together. Since you also get the uh, the CDR on your bomb and flanking strikes whenever you crit with your Fury of the Eagle. So that can be something to, to consider as well. And then when you have these two points, you kind of have like a, the option of putting them in either Birds of Prey, Bombardier, or one point here in Ferocity. Now, I feel like Bombardier is not that good, uh, mainly for the reason that you get too many bombs for it to be useful. Uh, maybe I'm just bad, I don't know, but I feel like this talent is not that good. It's not bad, I don't want to say that it's bad, but I think it's not that good. But it's definitely playable, so usually whenever I play Ruthless Mordor, it's going to be in AoE matchups regardless. So therefore I kind of prefer to just stick to Birds of Prey whenever I, um, whenever I play this. But uh, yeah, for the most part I will have a default with Spearhead. So... The thing about this talent is that it doesn't really do that much damage. It's mainly for the 50 yard dash that you get from it, which is really, really good. Especially on larger maps like Tolveron, maybe Imperial Domain, stuff like that. Or if you are against some caster and you know that you're going to be needing the uh, mobility from Spearhead. Because otherwise you could just kind of become a wheelchair if the only dash you have is like Harpoon, Disengage, Flanking Strikes, Sheeta, Freedom... Uh, you know, coordinate assault, you know, like you can be a little bit of a wheelchair. You also have a range slow. So I don't know, having one extra, one extra little dash, it definitely does help. So yeah, those are the talents that, that I would recommend. When it comes to the survival hunter tree, I feel like everything else is kind of cut in stone. I don't know if I would recommend anything else other than these three builds that I sort of recommended. Because I don't think that any one of them is better than the other. I just think that it depends on the game. It depends on the scenario, uh, which one will be better. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to figure that out on your own. See what uh, what type of game you're in. You know, if it's a small Mac, 
small map, a big map, what teammate you have, what teammate you are against, are you against some caster, or are you against some melee, you know? You kind of have to uh, make that decision for your own. And then over here, we have not really that many options. So I think the one talent point you can remove is this one in Natural Mending. Uh, since I feel like improved kill shot got a lot better, since crit is now going to be a stat that is actually pretty useful with the tier set, which I will talk about later. So with this talent point, you can either put it into Trailblazer, if you're playing something like, I don't know, a double DPS comp, or if you're playing... It's also pretty good in Shuffle, where you don't want to use Disengage in the opener, but you still want to be kind of fast. Maybe you're playing with like a Rogue or something. Um but you don't want to use disengage in the opener because you know you want to save it for later so it, it it'll just make it so like the opener you kind of become a little bit faster um also pretty decent in double dps comps so that's something but usually it's a very niche pick and then wilderness medicine is good into i would say sometimes mages because you have the ability to get your pet out of novas and stuff or maybe like a polymorph or like a ring of frost but usually i will play this in scenarios where I'm against a lot of cleave damage. So if you're against something like a demon hunter, even a feral druid, unholy DK have a lot of cleave, arms warrior have a, lo a lot of cleave, um, maybe some caster you can just kill your pet, maybe you're against like Destro Warlock with Chaos Bolts, you know, um, maybe something like a Frost Mage, blah, blah, you know, like a, a lot of classes that they can just kill your pet easily from either just like single targeting them or having a lot of cleave. This can definitely help your pet to stay alive a little bit longer. You also have the option of going Scare Beast, which is not that bad of a talent. I feel like it's very, very underrated at the moment. I feel like a lot of people don't pick it because it's like in an awkward scenario. But if you think about it, you're not really losing that much, especially in Shuffle. Since I see a lot of Hunters, they just kind of default into Natural Mending, which by itself is a really good default talent pick. But... It's hard sometimes in Shuffle to gain that much value out of Natural Mending, since you will, for the most part, only really get one acceleration off anyway in a short Shuffle round. So if you are against a Druid, even a Resto Druid, you can definitely experiment with Scare Beast and see if you can find it useful, because I think that it's pretty useful, um, mainly for the surprise factor, because not a lot of people actually go Scare Beast. So yeah, you're just gonna have to be careful that whenever you get kicked on Scare Beast, you're locked on Nature School. So Nature School is Intimidation, Serpent Sting, I think Acceleration, and then I know for a, for a fact that it's War of Sacrifice. So yeah, uh, you, you definitely can't use Ross, Serpent Sting, or Intim. And then maybe Exil. That one I'm not too sure of. I think it's also on Nature School. So just be careful. Just don't don't get kicked on Scare Beast and then try to pet stun a healer. That has happened so many times to me. I just feel like <laughs> you kind of become the biggest idiot whenever that happens. And then of course, if you are ever playing with the Interlope talent, which I will talk about later, Interlope over here, then you are of course required to, uh, to pick up Misdirection. But uh, I will talk about that later. So yeah, that is pretty much it when it comes to talents. You could, in theory, also pick up Steel Trap if you want to drop Serpent Sting for it. The problem that I have with this is that I, th I think that Latent Poison in general, the damage that you gain from it, is more valuable than Steel Trap will ever be, for the most part. Um, you, can, you could make the argument that in twos, sometimes, it could be better to play a build like this and then you drop Explosive Shot for it, which I kind of would agree with if you are playing a style of twos where you're maybe against like a Demon Hunter, and instead of killing the Demon Hunter by like, you know, doing goals or whatever, you just try to be annoying and just attack the healer, but maybe maybe doing a strategy like scatter into Steel Trap, and then Tar Trap Root, and then Cyclone, and then just running on the healer the entire game. That is like... Basically, the only time that I would ever recommend Steel Trap, it's in some matchups in twos. In threes and shuffle, I feel like Steel Trap almost have, I mean, very little value. The only ma value that you would ever gain from Steel Trap, in my opinion, is if you're against a Disc Priest. If you ever get, like, a chance to, I don't know, Steel Trap a Disc Priest, maybe behind the pillar, or something like that, so they can't heal. But for the most part, you're going to gain way more value from having Explosive Shots, since the damage is just... Pretty good. Um, it, it's That's kind of how survival plays nowadays. 
it's not really like a mongoose bite sustain damage type of build. It's more of a you just press all your buttons in a go and you kill them in a go. You're kind of like a sub rogue in a way, but not really, but kinda. So yeah, those are the talents. Not really too much to go over. Um, you can't ever really go this. It's just completely horrendous. The, you could make the argument that Born to be Wild is like half decent, which I would agree with. If you maybe drop natural mending, serrated shots, and then you have two points in Born to be Wild. This seems very interesting, but I think it's going to be a thing mainly for threes. But for shuffle and twos, I think it's awful. But th just know that this exists. Someone has been cooking up in the lab, Born to be Wild, two points in 3v3 arena gameplay. But I feel like if you're playing threes anyway and you want to have like a long game regardless, I feel like it would just be better to just play two points natural mending in a long game. Uh, because this only gains you value in long games, of course. Well, kind of, I guess you get eagle like 18 seconds faster, which could theoretically help. But um, just know that it, it's, an, it's an option. If you really want to, uh, you have you have the ability to go two points in board to be wild, and then if you really want to cook, you can drop trank shot for sentinel out, which I would not recommend. But it's like you could do this if you are crazy. But I feel like it's uh, I don't know about that. But uh, yeah, I'm just uh, leaving it up to you guys. You can you can you can do that if you really want to, but <laughs> it's not something that I would recommend. <laughs> Let's see where else where else are we now? Okay, PvP talents, let's go. So, let's see, what do we have? What do we have? Um, I'm first of gonna start with the two that I think are baseline for the most part in almost every single game. And then the third one will depend on the scenario. So, I think survival tactics, now with the change that... So, it kind of got buffed and nerfed at the same time. For the most part though, it is a buff. Since... It lasts for three seconds, which is an eternity in PvP. If you've pre faked up a stun or something, you're just immune the entire stun. Like, there's almost no way you can ever die. Or if you spam feign death out of a stun, you basically cannot die out of it. Because you can always do, like, feign death and then acceleration and then just, like, run away. And you're just immune to damage for basically three seconds. So, um, it is a little bit of a nerf into some classes like Fire Mage, Affliction Warlock. But... I would almost consider it a buff into Elemental Shamans and um, Shadow Priests because I always disliked the um, the fact that if you've pressed Feign Death, you got knocked up by Elemental Shamans and into Shadow Priests, you got horrified from VT. So for me, that's like a nice quality of life change. The fact that you don't have to worry about, you know, I guess that ever happening. Or maybe in some very niche cases, I was like, kind of annoyed into Affliction Warlocks because whenever you feign death you get silenced and when you're silenced you can't use Intim so I specifically remember moments where I wanted to feign death a fear and then stun the healer at the same time but I couldn't because I got silenced so you just don't have to worry about like any of those weird cases but the fact that you can't feign death roots anymore is definitely a nerf into something like sticking to a resto druid if you get mouse rooted maybe um, earth grab totem or just roots in general is way more annoying to deal with now that you can't feign death them anymore. So that is something to keep in mind. But however, I don't know if there is any situation where you can't take tactics. It's a really, really good talent. I would just recommend having it every single time. And if you don't run tactics, you have to know why in like very specific niche cases where it's like okay not to do it. But if you're not like super experienced with that, I would just recommend always going tactics. Then the second talent I would recommend always is Chimerial Sting. So this is a thing that you put on someone and then they become slowed. Then three seconds after the slow, they become silenced. And then after that, they get the Viper's Venom, which is the 20% damage for, and whatever. Uh, the Viper's Venom doesn't really matter too much. It's mainly a thing into something like a Resto Druid because you're reducing the, the dots that they do. I mean, the hots that they do. But it's mainly for the silence. Um, so you can, for example, do silence on a priest. And then you can, on the silence, you can always harpoon trap. And then they can't fade, they can't death. So yeah. There are some things you have to keep in mind though with this talent. There are a lot of healers that can outplay this. So as an example, if you are against a paladin, just know that they can still press freedom. While they are slowed by the scorpion venom. 
and then you know they will instantly trigger the silence but then you know they can be pretty fast so it can be kind of hard to maybe go in for a harpoon trap if they're like on their horse with freedom up so that's something that you have to keep in mind or it can be pretty bad as well because uh, Camille is a very telegraphed ability since if they become slowed they know that the silence will come later so then they can give them time to like preemptively do something so as a paladin if you're slowed by Scorpid Venom, you can always like preemptively do a uh, blessing of, well, what is it? like a sacrifice on a teammate so you can't get trapped. If you are a priest, you can maybe pre-PS, you can maybe put on a dome, um, you can maybe grip someone. If you are a resto shaman, you can always do something like putting an earthen wall down, maybe like a pre-healing tide, maybe pre-grounding totem. You can even press aura mastery whenever you get silenced. I mean, whenever you get slowed, so the silence won't trigger. Um, if you're a holy priest, you can press spirit of the, of the redeemer. Um, if you're a monk, you can just port away. Or if you are silenced and a hunter harpoons you, just know that the monk can still press incap on you because incap is a physical school, so you, it still works if, if they're silenced. So basically, every healer still has like a way to outplay the spell. So you have to keep that in mind as well whenever you play with Camerial. But other than that, it is a great spell. It works both offensively and defensively. If you want to stop a go, maybe if you're against like a shadow priest, you can always press this. On the Shadow Priest as you stun trap the healer so they can't master spell. Or maybe you can do it on a elemental shaman. So they can't ground the trap. If you're going for a trap. Maybe you're against like Resto Druid Ella. You know, you could just come Ariel, the Ella Shaman. Then when the Ella Shaman is silenced, you can then go in for a harpoon trap on the healer so they can't ground the trap. So there are millions of different ways that you can use Camerial. Um too many to even count. So yeah, but it's a really, really good talent, so I would recommend you take this almost every single time. And then the third one, which is basically going to be situational for the most part. So I would say the top four ones that are good is going to be Mending Bandage, which is mandatory into As a Rogue and Feral Druid. We then have Sticky Tar. There are some things you want to know about Sticky Tar, the fact that the disarm. Um, so... If you press Sticky Tar on a Rogue, and they press Cloak, the Cloak will remove the Sticky Tar. But you can press Sticky Tar into a Rogue that already has Cloak applied. Even if they have the Super Cloak talent. Good to know. Same thing with AMS. If a DK is disarmed, and they press AMS, the DK the disarm will go away. But if they already have AMS on them, you can still apply the sticky tar bomb. So those are some weird interactions. Know that you can ground sticky tar bomb. So you might think that it's a physical school because you can ground it. You can also spell reflect it. But it does not go through bop. Or this magic bop. So it's like a weird combination of physical and magical application. Which is really, really weird. And there also is a bug with Sticky Tar Bomb where if you press it on someone and then you line of sight as it lands. Here, for example, you see how I was in line and then I go out of line as it lands. It will not work. This is especially infuriating if you're trying to do a go on or maybe if you're trying to uh, disarm a rogue that's doing a go on your teammate. Let's say your teammate is like maybe behind here, right? Or the rogue is behind here. And then you press the disarm on the rogue. If the rogue just goes behind the pillar as the disarm is flying through the air, the disarm will not work. Same thing with Shadowy Jewel. If the disarm um, is in the air and then the rogue presses Shadowy Jewel, the rogue will not be disarmed. Because you have to be in the line of sight of the target you're pressing the disarm on as it lands on the target. It is the most infuriating bug. I'll just... I'll write a comment if, if it gets fixed, but it's uh, really, really annoying, so that's good to keep in mind. Then we have Trank Darts, which is almost, I mean, I'd say basically mandatory into something like a Resto Druid or um, Provoker, the healing evoker spec. Um, so how it works is that whenever you press Trank Shot, which is your purge, or you kick someone, you also reduce every purgeable debuff that they have. I mean, every purgeable buff by four seconds. So as an example, let's say if they have like overgrowth on, you know, you can press trank darts, just, you know, you just trank shot them. You will then purge a buff 
and then every single purgeable buff that they have will be reduced by four seconds. Um, the tooltip is a little bit weird because it has so many like AOE components to it. Um, just know that nearby enemies is 12 yards. So that's like around this type of distance, like usually like around here. So yeah, but just know that it always prioritizes the target that you actually click uh, trank darts or the, the one that you purge. I mean, the, the one that you purge or the one that you kick. It, it, it will always reduce <laughs> those buffs first and then it will prio nearby people. But usually I don't really pay that much attention to the AOE part of Trank Darts. I feel like it just makes the spell kind of weird and wonky to read. But just know that it is there, but it's not really something that is like important. Uh, this also makes it really good into mages, since you can guarantee purge alter time if you press Trank Darts when alter time has four seconds or less. Right? Since it will just remove everything that is... Like, it, it will remove everything for four seconds. So if it's four seconds on Alter Time or the Temporal Shield, you will just remove it 100% guaranteed. So it's really, really good in, into mages as well. So that's something to uh, to keep in mind. And then the fourth talent that is like situationally good is Diamondize, which mainly will be played in either Shuffle, where you're playing with a teammate that has uncontrollable AoE that they cannot do anything about. So something like a Demon Hunter... Unholy DK or a Demon Warlock, where even Boomy to an extent, where even if they don't want to, they are going to break CC because that's just like how their class works, right? So then Diamondites will be kind of sick in, into that if you have uh, one, one of those teammates. And then also, if you are against a Demon Hunter or maybe against a Warlock with Imp or Reverse Magic, yeah, you know, you can't. You know, you can't reverse magic a diamondize, you can't master spell diamondize if you're against a shadow priest. There is nothing that can remove diamondize. It's just Yeah, you're just you're just stuck in the diamondize. So that that's uh the other talent that I would recommend going. So for the most part, it will just depend on what you're against, what PvP talents you will go. I'd say a nice default is just sticky tar. And then if they don't have a caster, um, I mean if they don't have a melee. Uh, you could just go Trank Darts, for the most part. And then if they have a, a, a like a Poison Dispeller, or someone that you need to need, need to remove something, like an Asa Rogue or a Feral Druid, I'd recommend go Mending Bandage. And then if maybe you're against a Demon Hunter, or you're against a Demon Hunter, or you have a Demon Hunter on your team, I would just recommend go Diamond Eyes, and that's about it. It's hard to say when you're in a scenario where it's like, oh, what if there's a Resto Druid? And the Demon Hunter. Well, then I can't go Diamond Eyes and Trank Dart at the same time. Well, now you're in, in a scenario where it's like, okay, is it worth it to drop Camerial for Diamond Eyes? Can I drop Tactics for Camerial? You know? So, this is where it kind of becomes tricky. And you kind of have to make this decision on your own. Because even I don't even know. You know, this will depend on the teammates that I'm even against. Like, I know, for example, if I'm against... Um, or if I'm against like a bad demon hunter, maybe, I know that I can probably always crowd control them whenever I go for a trap. So therefore I'm not even going to go diamond eyes because it's like whatever, I can always outplay the demon hunter by maybe doing a scatter tar trap on them whenever I want to go in. So the, it will just depend. It's very hard to say what is the best talent in every given situation. So... This will just depend on uh, each scenario. So yeah, just play around with it. I feel like I've rambled, rambled too much about PvP talents, but it's kind of tricky because I, I get asked this all the time. Like, hey man, what talents do I go? And it's like, I don't know. It kind of depends. That's like the answer that I give to <laughs> basically everything. But it's true. It is true. It depends. Um, also, personal preference matters as well. Maybe you are horrible at pressing trank darts. You know? maybe you just suck and you need a reminder to press trank shot all the time because maybe you just forget then I don't know don't go this talent pick maybe something like diamond I don't know if you're really good at tracking warbreaker from warriors and you always disarm every warbreaker nice good job play this talent it's really good for you let's say if you throw your disarm randomly every single time and you're against warrior rest of druid I don't know, bro. Don't go disarm. Maybe go trank towards. Maybe that suits you better, you know? So just experiment. Try whatever works for you. Um, just know that there are no right or wrong answers here. Except if, I don't know, 
that some of them are like a little bit stinky like hunting pack but it can be fun sometimes just experiment with it um uh, yeah that's about it let's see what else do we have to talk about oh we got the pets right so let me go over to the stable master over here ba -da -da -da. Ta -da. so here are the pets that i would recommend the number one pet would be a undead raptor so undead raptors are good and bad because they are immune to stuff like polymorph hex sap imprison scare beast hibernate even though the scare beast hibernate doesn't really matter anymore because their talents no one really plays but uh, yeah you'll mainly play this into mages so they can't polymorph your pet that is like the biggest thing that it's good into the only bad thing about it is the fact that Red Paladins can stun undead pets with the Wake of Ashes. So never ever in your entire life can you ever have an undead pet into a Red Paladin. It's really bad. Don't do it ever. It should never happen. And then I need to stir up something. No, undead pets are not immune to fear. They have never been immune to fear. I don't know who started this but wh or where it came from. But if, if anyone has ever told you, hey bro, pick up an undead pet. They're immune to fear. They have never been immune to fear. It's, they, it, yeah, I think maybe Wrath of the Lich King beta, maybe sure, Undead were immune to fear. But since like at least 2008, they have <laughs> never been immune to fear. So that's that's some classic garbage that people have been telling you. Second pet you can have is a Raptor, Hyena, or a Rodent, because they share the exact same ability as this pet. I can go to Wowhead and up in Potopia and show you. So... Cunning pets give you pathfinding, which is 80% movement speed, and master's call. So, you want to scroll down to mortal wounds, which is basically the only pet type that is important here. If you are playing with a teammate that already has mortal strike, something like a rogue, or a warrior, or a, I mean, demon hunters, even like a feral druid, I would still recommend to have a mortal wound pet. Because there are some scenarios where, like, maybe your team is CC'd, maybe your pet is, you know, attacking someone else for, like, a quick second. Because all of the other abilities are so awful. Except for maybe one. Except for maybe one. I'll talk about that later, later though. So, yeah, just pick any hyena, raptor, or rodent. This does not really matter in the slightest. This pet will do the exact same thing as this guy, as this guy... Same as this guy, and then this guy. I just currently have this skunk, because he's a, he's a rare in the new zone. I think he's kind of cute, so that's the bad boy that I'm rocking. So this is the pet that I run almost like 90% of, of the time. So whenever you see me in arena, I will usually have this. Yeah. Third pet is going to be your bloodlust pet. Now, Bloodlust pets are going to be good in RBGs because they made it so you can now pop Bloodlust in RBG. It's good in something like... I mean, even a normal Battleground, it's still really, really good. So this, this will be your... Uh, 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 let me see here. Right here. You can have a Carrion Bird, Ravenger, Scorpid, or a Wasp. They all do the exact same thing. I would also recommend you can tame a little bee. They're kind of cool if you don't want to have the Carrion Bird that I have, you know? It's just that I've had this guy since 2014, so he's kind of old, so I need, need to keep him. But the B is also very, very cool here. Um, also good in PvE, like if you're doing dungeons, if you're just doing like world quest or whatever. Any time that having Bloodlust or Leech would be a good option, which is kind of a lot whenever you're doing PvE stuff. Then, yeah, really good to have a, uh, a Bloodlust pet available. And then the fourth pet will be a tank pet. So... The tank pet you will have in scenarios where you can die 100 zero in a in a in a CC chain. So usually into sub rogues it will be something that will be really really good. And then note same thing. I have a lizard, but Direhorn, Hydra, River, they do the exact same thing, right? So you can have this guy, this guy. You can even have one of these bad boys. You can maybe even have one of these. This is the one that I have. Um, you can have this or. You know, I think this this is the most common one that you usually see, but uh, I don't know. They're so ugly. I don't know why the why do people have these pets? I don't know, but they're so common. But yeah, uh, this is really good because it gives you this five percent more max HP, and then Portrait of the Bear, which is a so how it works is that it, you first get the health, and then you get 
the the heal. So since you it's the heal is based on the HP that you gain, it's technically like a 24% heal, right? Of overall. Basically, I just say 25 because lol, it's like a nice number. Uh, but just know that this synergy is really, really well with um acceleration because it's also based on your max HP, which is also getting buffed to 40% next patch. So if you basically want to lay on hands, you can just press Fortitude of the Bear and then press Acceleration. And then, wow, that's a lot of health. You can even do an Emblem Drinket into Fortitude of the Bear, into Acceleration, in that order. Very important to do it in that order if you want to get the maximum HP possible. Because obviously doing something like Acceleration, then Fortitude of the Bear, and then pressing Emblem, that would be really, really cringe. So yeah, just also note... All of your pet abilities can be used while you are in CC. The command pet, which is this spell over here. Um, this one over here. Command pet, let me see. This is your pet. Wait, where is it? Am I trolling? Oh, here. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, you, you can see here how it's like all three of those spells. Just know that... If your pet is crowd controlled, you can't use them. It's only if if you are CC but your pet is free, then you can use them. There's also a bug with uh, Master's Call, which is very annoying, but it's only a tooltip error. This is why I have Master's Call over here. And I will show you what happens. So if you are not in line of your pet and you press Master's Call, do you see how it goes on cooldown? But I didn't get Master's Call because I was behind the pillar of my pet, right? But this is a fake... This is this is a bug. So you see here, it's still available. I can now press Master's Call. Ta-da! And it works. So, yeah, you kind of need to have Master's Call also visible on your pet bar because if you only do show tooltip command pet, like the macro that I have uh, right here, it's not going to work. You can theoretically fix this issue by having like, oh my god, you can technically speaking do this. Master's call. Right? This would this would fix it. But like the problem now is that if you ever swap pet to a uh, oh. Well now my tank pet ability is not working. And then if you go over to like a monster's call pet, I mean a bloodlust pet, and now you can't see the seed of this one either. So you kind of sort of just have to bite the bullet and uh, yeah. Just add Master's Call to your pet ability over here so you can see the cooldown um, and know it's 100% legitimate. So yeah. Um, and then, you know, when you would pick the pet, that would just... I, I think I went over that. Wait, did I? Yeah, I think I did. It would, it would just depend if you need Master's Call or if you need... You know, the extra heal from the from the pet thing. So yeah. And then the last pet, the wild card. Oh my god, what is this? This is a blood blood boy. Now the reason why you would want to have this. I don't actually have a keybind for it because I use it so often. I mean so rare. Um <laughs> it has a ranged slow and it's a tank pet. Now what would you want to have a ranged slow into, you may say? Um yeah, this has one use case. It's good into rogue mage in twos. Yep, that's it. It's good into rogue mage in twos. Because you can like slow the mage or the rogue behind the pillar. It's also a ranged ability, so that's like can slow you from here, which is kinda like obnoxious. So yeah, this pet good in rogue mage twos. I mean against rogue mage. But in threes, never. Uh, I guess you could maybe do like a duel if you're ever dueling someone in like the open world. I guess then you could also maybe go slow pet, maybe if you want to. But I don't know. I would just stick to having that pet as like a rogue mage 2's counter. But it's kind of niche. But uh, that's uh, that's about it. Then we have gear and embellishments. So here's the thing, dog. Here's the thing. You have two options. When it comes to your embellishment. So I'm going to pause the video. And I'm going to make my way downtown. So you guys can uh, have a smooth transition. Hello team. We are officially back. So here are the two options that you have with your embellishments. Either you can go the Venom Steep Stompers. On the boots. 
and then you have the Toxified Armor Patch on the helmet. So if you don't know what this is, on the helm, you can then go here, here, click on the Flame Torched Helmet, and then from the Auction House, you want to buy this item, the Toxified Armor Patch. And then just know, it doesn't really matter the item recipe, You can this is the same as this. So what this does is that it doubles the effectiveness of your Venom Steeped Stompers. So this will give you 2,200 versatility and you will lose 800 mastery. It, and then this is with your gear, if you have Versa as your highest stat, which I would recommend. So yeah, it's 2.2k Verse and you lose 800 mastery. But mastery is your worst stat by far, so it doesn't really matter. Now, the thing about this is that when you get the actual proc, which is usually two procs per minute, lasts for 10 seconds, so it's like up for, what would that be? Um, one third of the time. But usually not. Usually it's up like 25 to 20% of an arena game. So yeah, whenever you get the buff, it's like 10% more damage overall, which is really, really good. So it has the highest potential burst damage out of any embellishments in the entire game. So I would recommend it for that reason alone. However, there is another thing that you can do if you don't want to get like this RNG. If you get the proc, then it's like big damn, but if you don't, it's like not that good. You can then go for the inferior boots with a Draco Thirst Wrist. So there you go here, you go to your feet, and then you want to have the inferior boots. So this scales with your eye level. So I think, I'm pretty sure when you have full 389, I might be wrong, but it I think it gives you around 700 agi. And then, you know, because that is increased by 20% over here, so that would be like 840. So around 840 agility, which is not bad at all. It, it's really, really good and like, you know, kind of easy to get. You could just get it whenever you press purge or tartar brute or harpoon or trap or anything like that. And then the set that you want to have with it, or the second embellishment, is these ones, the Adaptive Draco Thirst Arm Guards, which at 289 eye level will give you... It's 419... Wait, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna double check. Uh, well, actually, it's uh, 443 and 443. So, yeah, I was kind of wrong about that one. But yeah, this one is also really, really good. So yeah, those are basically the embellishments that you have. Either you want to go for the, the more sustained damage with Adaptive Draco Thirst and then the Infurious Boots, or if you want to go for the Toxified Venom Steep Stompers with the patch. Now, if I'm going to be honest, I think that I made a mistake when I made all of my characters. Um, once I get full gear, I will be converting over to the Adaptive Draco Thirst Arm Guards and the Inferior Boots. So if, if you're making a new Hunter nowadays, that's what I would recommend. Um, I haven't really been able to do the math on it because, you know, I don't have access to TR, sadly, which is the Tournament Realm. But uh, my intuition is telling me, maybe I just really miss these embellishments. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going back to those. If you're making a fresh Hunter, fresh from the factory... Those will be the embellishments that I would recommend. But just know, either way, however you pick it, however it goes, it does not really matter that much. It's not like the biggest of deals. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go back to the to the launch though. So yeah, beer be. Oh, hello team, we are back. So here's the thing about the gearing si situation. Um, what I would recommend in PvP, just know that these stats are a little bit wrong. Because it's going to be showing more in PvP. But what you wanna wanna have in PvP in war mode is 30% verse. And then you have two options with your haste. I would recommend either 33.34 or you should check the math. So I'm gonna go for 1.12 GCD. Don't ask me why. Why do you wanna have 1.12 GCD? I don't know. I like the number, okay? It's a cool number. 12 is kind of sick. But you can also go for 1.13, which would be. Um, 32.15, this rounds up to, so it's actually 32.16. Um, so yeah, those are the two options that I would have. I think you could also, in theory, maybe go for like 1.15 if you are like not that good at doing your rotation. 
So then that would be 29.87. This would be the maximum that I would go. So let me see if I can type it in a way that is like actually kind of makes sense. Um, let's make a new here. Gear. Thurbs and verse. And then you can have either 1.12 till 1.15 GCD, which basically translates to either you go 3.34% haste um, or 29.87. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then of course anything in between so it's very important whenever you get your, your gear to always do the math to see if you're close to a break point so as an example right if you're chilling on like 31% haste you know and you're like oh wow am I close to a, to a break point you can always hop on to the calculator type in 1.31 and then equals x and then you see what you what is your GCD gonna be oh it's 1.14 Five, which would round down. So this should be one. Oh no, look, this is really bad. If you have 31% haste, you will actually not get 1.13 because you're very, very close off. So here, to get the 1.13, wait, 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 wait. Look, wait, look at this, look at this. Because now if I type this and then I go 1.13, how much haste would you need to, to get this? You would need, oh no, I'm at 1.14, I'm sorry. Um, oh no, never mind. Yeah, 31% is actually exactly right on the 14 GCD. Never mind. Disregard what I said. I'm not going to re record the guide because I'm too lazy, but I, I was wrong. Just do the math. See if you want to get uh, maybe 1.13 GCD. How much haste do you need? You need 32.16 GCD. So yeah, just. Do the math, see what you need, but I would say either between 1.12 1.15 GCD is like a fine baseline. Um, anything below or less, I think it's cringe. Just go between 33.34 and 29.87% haste. Thank you. Then after this, you want to like just max out on crit. That's pretty much it. You can maybe go for a little bit more Versa. You can go for a little, little bit more crit, but I'm probably going to go this. 30% Verse. 33.34% haste, and then everything else will, will be crit. Maybe I'll have like 31% verse, 32% verse. I don't know. I don't not too sure how my gear is gonna pan out once I have fully geared, but that is the gear that I'm going to have. So yeah. What else do we have? Macros, right. Let me hop over to my uh, to my macro paste bin that I have over here. So, quickly I will just talk about the spell queue window. Now, if you don't know what the spell queue window is, it is actually very, very, very important. So, what it does is, you know how you press buttons on your keyboard, and then you can press the button before it actually put, becomes available. You can try this yourself. You can press the cooldown or the, the spell without it fully being up. See? I'm pressing it a little, little, little bit earlier, and then it goes off instantly. So if you want to, if you want to make this higher, you can then do this, where you type in dish. Let's say I have it set to 400, which is like really cringe. Oh, can I drop combat? Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. So default is 400. So you would just uh, type this in, just like so. And then if I type this in, I will now see that I have 400 spell cube window. So what this means is, uh, let me just do this to hide my shot. You can press your spell at 400 milliseconds become, before it becomes available, and then it will go off. So click, 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 click. You see, you see, like how I can press the spell 400 milliseconds before it actually goes off. And then on the other end, end of the extreme, if you have it set to zero. Then now look what, what will happen. Click. 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 You have no time whatsoever. There's no lenience. You can only click the button as it becomes available, which is kind of bad. So the, the bad thing about having set to 400, which is the default, is that it introduces a lot of input lag. So whenever you have low haste, it will become very, very awkward to do your spells in the right order. So what I would recommend, and what most people would, would recommend, is that you set your spell queue window to either your 
world MS and then add 100 or 150. So as an example, I play with 35 ping for the most part. So my spell queue window is 135. But I think if you play with something like me, like 30 ping, the highest that I would ever recommend would be something like 200. I feel like other than that, the input delay would just be like way too annoying to deal with. So I'm just going to set 135, type this in, bada bing, bada boom. And also, good to know, console commands, you type it in one time and then you don't have to worry about it ever. You just type it in one time and then you're chillaxing kind of hard. Um, and then over here I'm talking about like, oh my god, I'm on the wrong scene, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, where you can cancel your spell queue animation. So if you remember how I said whenever you have very high spell queue window, whenever you click the button, it will just go off when it's available, right? But with CQS, you will cancel that. So this is good to have on buttons like kill shot, where maybe you are like spamming your mongoose bite like this, and then you have already queued your next mongoose bite, but then you realize that, that, that it become low, so you try to press kill shot, but the kill shot won't go through because you've already buffered the previous spell. Do you know what I mean? So then having spell queue, I mean CQS, I think I have it, um, yeah, I, I have it on my freezing trap and my tar trap. Do I have it on my, on, on my kill shot? I have it on int him too. Wait, am I smoking crack? I think I do, right? Checking? Oh, I actually don't. Oh, because I, never mind, I know why. I was, um, I was doing some fiddling about my, my macros, but yeah, usually I have CQS on my kill shot. This is just very recent. I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was experimenting with something before I before I, I even did this, so yeah I would recommend yeah CQS kill shot maybe trap maybe tar trap doesn't really do that much but it's like it's a nice thing to have I mean, no reason not to so yeah just make sure that you have it before the actual spell though otherwise you will cancel the own queue of this spell which is kind of cringe so always make it before thank you and then um. I like to think about my macros, if you guys really want to go in depth about this, I'm not going to like yabber and blabber all about it. I have pretty in depth talking about my pace bin on all my macros, so instead of me yapping over it in this video, um, I'm just going to link the pace bin. You guys can read it for yourself. I just wanted to explain the CQS because I feel like even with my explanation here written in words, some people don't understand, which is very fair because it's kind of like, what the fuck? Especially if you don't even know that this even exists in the game so yeah that's about it wait what else did i want to talk about cool the tips and tricks right people have asking for the longest time hey can i just get some tips and tricks even if you i'm like a experienced hunter or whatever it's like sure buddy i have some tips and tricks i'm sure there's gonna be like plenty more that i missed out but i just wrote this in like i don't know five minutes so yeah number one track hidden should always be available. Now, why should track hidden always be available? I'm on the wrong scene, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> the reason why is because this gives you 10 yards extra stealth detection. So default is five yards, but if you have track hidden, it becomes 15. So 15 is like around here, you know? So if you're on stealth, you can see 15 yards. In theory, obviously lag and everything can like, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the default is 5, which is around here. So, yeah. If my pet is 15, then, yeah, it basically doubles your stealth detection radius, which is very important to have. Just make sure all of your hunters just put on track hidden. You will thank me later. Next up are spells you can use in turtle. So these are Knock Trap, Tar Trap, Freezing Trap, Master's Call, Scare Beast, and Tracker's Nut. Um, good to know. You don't have to cancel turtle to press these buttons. They are, they work. Same thing with Roar of Sacrifice, Acceleration, Feign Death, Survival of the Fittest, Command Pet, which is Master's Call, the, your Bloodlust, and uh, the 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 Fortitude of the Bear. Yeah, uh, Mending Bandage, Mend Pet, and then Play Dead and Wake Up. And if you don't know what Play Dead and Wake Up is, it is actually this is why I'm here. Um, it's a spell that you have to learn from this guy over here. Hello. Uh, where is it? Hmm, there it is. So what this does, it's basically the same thing as Feign Death, except your pet now also Feign Deaths. 
So this is useful if you are against a feral druid that's causing cyclone on your pet to try to get like a you know a feral frenzy proc. You could just pet when they have the clone, so you don't have to interrupt it. Or if a warlock is maybe trying to kill your pet or causing like chaos bolt, kind of murder it, whatever. You can just pet find death. So yeah, I'd say nowadays in modern WoW, usually being um, being used to stop feral druids from getting a feral frenzy proc from your pet, you just pet find death, and then you're kind of chillaxing just like that. And if you don't want to access the true shot launch, you now you can also buy it from the Toran here in Nessingwary base camp. So this is a little bit easier to get. But yeah, either go here, or just go to this guy over here, in the high mountain. Yeah. Uh-huh. What other spells can you use in Turtle? You can use Disengage, Flare, Shira, Misdirection slash Interlope, Dismiss Pet, Camouflage, Aspect of the Eagle, and Eagle Eye. Now, Eagle Eye, if you don't know what it is, it's just, just I don't know, fun spell to use, to look around and stuff. And if you're asking me how can I use Eagle while I am inside Eagle, listen, buddy, this is why you should read the macro paste pen. It's, it's literally right here, man. It's like. It's literally here. Ta da! <laughs> okay. <coughs> what else do we have? Um, oh, yeah. These things you can't use in Turtle, but you could before. Before, th they changed it. Hunter's Mark was usable in Turtle. Not anymore. Steel Trap. Oh, I didn't know. I'm so cringe. Uh, where's the Sticky Tar Bomb? Right. You can use your Disarm while you are in Turtle. That's also good to know. <coughs> I kind of forgot about this. Um, but yeah, you can't use Hunter's Mark, you can't use Steel Trap, and you can't use Wild Kingdom. Even though back in the day, you could use all three of these spells in Turtle. Um, you no longer can't. So yeah, unlucky. The number three, using Peton to keep someone in combat. This is especially good against Resto Druid in twos and threes. So, what will happen is that if you trap someone, like a Resto Druid or a Rogue, or maybe a Rogue gets in a, in a Cyclone or whatever, whatever CC that they will drop combat and you want to keep them in combat, like a Rogue or a Druid or blah blah blah. You can pet taunt them so they gain combat while they're inside the CC. This especially is good when your teammate is cloning a rogue, right? Because what will happen is that PvP combat is 6 seconds, clone is 6 seconds, you guys do the math, what do you think will happen at the end of the clone? That's right, the rogue will drop combat. Now, to counter this, what I see people do is just put up flare, which... I mean, this works, but they could just, you know, walk out of it and then press stealth, like they're not in combat. So what you can do is just, just pet taunt them while they're inside the CC, and then they will gain combat. So, good job. Um, yeah, that would be my recommendation of choice. Something else you can do is taunting specific pets. I have um, this nifty little macro over here on my dismiss pet. Um, you can taunt things like Suen, the cat from the monk, or maybe an enemy hunter pet, just to like minimize their damage a little bit. Um, so yeah, good to have. I think having this to your dismiss pet macro makes a lot of sense, because you can't use dismiss pet anyway in arena, so this to me makes a lot of sense. And then I just have target one to three... You don't need to do this, it's just, I, I like it. <laughs> it's, I don't know, I just like it, so that's just me. Uh, and then speaking of pet taunt, you might have seen whenever people taunt your pet, it's like, oh my god, ah, you see? Maybe a paladin or something will um, pre-taunt your pet uh, whenever you go in for a trap on them. Same thing with monks can also do this, or... Uh, Druids, if they are in bear form, they can also taunt your pet to so you break your own trap with your pet. The way to counter this is to just pet move. You know, you just move the pet, and then you're chilling. So it's just with the move pet. So you just have a keybind for this. Uh, yeah, you trap. Even if the, if the pet is taunted, the thing about move pet is that it will automatically do a pet stay, which is uh, the, this. You see? It will just stay. Stand still. Can't do a command. So instead of just having stay as a keybind, just move pet and then 
<laughs> yeah. Um, it will negate the, their taunt because your pet's not doing anything. But just note that if your pet is taunted and you press kill command on another person, it will do damage to the person that, that, that you press taunt on. So just be careful. Don't... It's, it, it's a bait. Just wait until the taunt is over. Last for four seconds. And then... Then you're fine. Um, so, yeah. Next up. We have knowing how Roar of Sacrifice works. So this changes from expansion to expansion, which is why it's kind of weird. But how it works now is that it's casted by the hunter, but it requires 40 yard line of sight of the hunter, and also 40 yards not line of sight of the pet. And the, the pet part is to the person you're pressing Roar of Sacrifice on, not the hunter. So that might be very confusing, but let's say you are... Uh, ba -da -ba -da. Let's say my pet is literally behind the pillar over here, you know, and I want to press Roar of Sacrifice on my turnip, you know. Right now I can do it because my pet is within 40 yards of the target and I am within 40 yards line of sight of the target. So here it is possible to, to press it. However, if, the, if we reverse the rolls... Now I cannot press Roar of Sacrifice on this guy because I am not in line of sight even though my pet is in line of sight. So before Ross was your pet line, now it's hunter line. But at the, at the same time, if your pet is vibing over here, maybe your pet is like maybe really, really far. So in this scenario, I am within 40 yards of my pet, but not this guy. So in this scenario, I can't Ross this person but I can Ross myself, because my pet is no not 40 yards between, you know, like this. So basically, if your pet is, is, a, is like attacking someone, and you get put in, into a smoke bomb, you can use Roar of Sacrifice on yourself, even though you're not in line of your pet, because the pet portion of it ignores line of sight. Got it? Yeah. It's, I know it's very weird, but uh, <laughs> that's how that works. Also, if the hunter is in CC... It doesn't matter, you can always use Ross. If the pet is in CC, you cannot use Ross. Except for... There are some exceptions. Every disorient that makes your pet run around, you can still use Ross. So that is things like Dragon's Breath from Mage, Blind from Rogue, and the DK Blind. Uh, what is the name of the DK Blind? I feel like I can just... Check it up right now. Very cool guy that I'm making here. Um, and Pala Blind. Right. So, if your pet is chilling in a blinding sleet, a Dragon's Breath, a Rogue Blind, or uh, the Paladin Blind, since these are disorients that make the pet run around, for whatever reason, you can. it doesn't... like The game doesn't think that your pet is CC'd. So you can do every ability that re requires your pet, which is... Kill Command, Intimidation, and Roar of Sacrifice. Which, as funny as it is, if you... <laughs> if the pet... Okay, if, 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 if a mage tries to DB ring your pet, you can still intim the mage while your pet is in a Dragon's Breath. Also, this works with a... Um, not regular polymorph, but it works with a mass polymorph. Uh, the talent. So just so you know, if your pet is in a mass polymorph, like a, like a mass polymorph, you can still use Intimidation, Kill Command, and Roar of Sacrifice. Good to know. Don't let Mage Player know this. Um, is it a bug? Probably, yeah. Has it been in, in the game since 2018? Yeah. Um, yeah. Now you know that it exists. I don't know why or how, but that's just, that's just how it is. Oh yeah, also, Intimidation. Um, it doesn't say anything about the yards, but just so you know, um, Intimidation is 50 yards from the pet. So I can stand over here. My pet can... Can I... 50 yards? Come on, buddy. Come on. Buddy. Here. He can stand over here, and I can be in Narnia. And I can... You see how this is still white? I can still pet taunt. So yeah. It's nothing to do with hunter yards. It's only pet. So if, if the pet is put in 50 yards of the person you want to stun, then it's... It's a stunnable target, so that's how that works. And then number five, 
Scattershot and Tracker's Net. So uh, these are a little bit weird. They don't break to certain types of damage. Now this includes Explosive Shot, Death Chakrams, and Bomb. The application of Bomb. Not the dot damage, but the application. So something that can be good to know is that the dot damage from Bomb comes 1.5 seconds after you press the Bomb. So if you do something like... Um, you can do, as an example, this is not going to break any CC whatsoever. You can always do <laughs> um, Explosive, Scatter, Death Chakrams, and then Bomb. And you see? The bomb, the scatter shot did not break. The only thing that they can break it is Master Marksman. But same thing with the bomb application. Master Marksman will proc 1.5 seconds after you get the crit. So you will always get a global off. So the niche cases where this is very useful are where you want to set up a kill go. Let's say you're playing with a sub rogue. And maybe maybe the, the sub rogue sheep shots the healer. As you go in for like a um, like a scatter shot, so you can you can pre scatter shot the kill target, already press death chakrams and explosive, and then you can stun, I mean, and you can trap the healer, knowing for a fact that you won't break the CC. So, valuable information. Same thing with trackers net. Um, even though trackers net is kind of a talent that I wouldn't really recommend it anymore, but it's the same thing here. You know, if you wanna, I don't know, net someone, you can do death chakrams and it won't break. Same thing with Bomb, lol, but it breaks to the dot damage, of course. Same thing with, with, with a, like Explosive. So if you want to kill someone in CC, you can, technically speaking, this is like a combo that I would recommend doing in like a 1v1 scenario, it's really really good to do in a 1v1, is that you do Explosive, Scatter Shot, Death Chakrams, Bomb, Intimidation. And then, I mean, what are they gonna do? Like, what can they even do? There's, like, nothing nothing much, really, to do there. Uh, oh, no, never mind. You can't do it because of the, the shortened duration. Yeah, you have to do Explosive, Death Chakram, Scatter, Bomb Trap. I mean, Bomb Stun. So, if in, like, a 1v1 scenario, you can always do the this into the Death Chakrams, and then you can do the Scatter, you can then Bomb, and then you can int him. Oh, no, maybe you can. Actually, I think you can do... Wait, I'm gonna go forward in the future and see if it's actually possible. Okay, I'm like 99% sure this is not going to work. I think you can only do Explosive, Death Chakrams, Scatter, Bomb, Trap without it breaking. But let's see, can you do Explosive, Scatter, Death Chakrams, Bomb, Stun? Oh, you can! Oh, well, you can clearly see that I don't use this combo very often. But uh, in 1v1s, this would be the combo that I would, that I, that I would recommend. Uh, yeah, you just do Explosive, Scatter... Death Chakrams, Bomb, um, yeah, and then Intem. And then after you land the Intem, you can then do your Fury of the Eagle, Bomb, Flanking, Bomb, which is something that I will talk about later with the with the Forset. The, the Forset, guys, it's really good. The Forset is really crazy right now for Survival Hunter. It's basically the only reason why it's actually viable right now. Ahem! <clears throat> um, let's go on with the, with the guide. Um, can I drop combat so I can use my... Thank you. Knowing how camouflage works. So, you might be like, what is what is camouflage even? It's just a stealth, right? Wrong. It is the most opposite thing from a stealth. So, here's a fun fact. If you are in stealth and your pet is in stealth, kill command will not take you or your pet out of stealth. This is really useful if you want to kill totems. Something like an Earthcrab Totem, maybe like a, I don't know, Earthbind, Grounding Totem, whatever. Usually it's just, you know, you kill Totems at the start. Or you just want to fish Tip of the Spear st stacks, you know, you can always do this. And uh, what you have to do is you have to do Kill Command and then Pet Passive. Because it's the Pet Auto Attack and Pet Claw that will like take it out, but not the actual Kill Command itself. Um, so yeah, that is... Rule case number one, also Intim won't take you out, out of stealth either, so that's good to know. Intim and Kill Command doesn't take the pet out of stealth, good to know. Second use case, I will show you in the future when I get my CD back. I didn't press pause, oh my god. So here, right, usually at the start of, of arena games, if you have no pet out, what you can do is you can go camo, 
and then you can summon your pet. Because now your pet is no longer attached to you, meaning your pet can do damage, it can take damage, it can literally die, and you can revive your pet. You can press ment pet, you can do whatever. It will not take you out of stealth. So my pet can literally die right now. It can like intim this guy, I can trap this guy. I will still be in, um, in stealth, which is kind of cool. So this works for all three hunter specs. Just note that if you are playing BM hunter, you need to have a macro on your kill command where it's like, if you are in stealth, then stop attack. So then you would just add to your kill command like, oh, uh, stop attack um, if stealth, you know, and then you're fine. But I'm playing MM, I mean survival, so it just doesn't work anyway. So hold. <coughs> you can't stop a melee swing from happening if it wants to happen. Um, one thing to keep in mind though, is that this is especially whenever you are playing a RBG, you have to be very, 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 very careful. If you summon a pet that is in stealth, when you are in stealth, it will drop your stealth. So as an example, I can show you once I get my CD back. Okay, because doing this in a RBG scenario, whenever you're like defending a base, is so good to do. But you have to be careful, because if you summon a pet that isn't stealth, it will still be in stealth when you summon it again. So now you might think, oh my god, my pet is no, no, no longer in stealth, I can then attack. But no. Remember, always summon a different pet that is not in stealth, and then now you can freely do damage with, with your pet. Because look now, if I summon the pet that was in stealth, it's still in stealth, so now if I attack, well now I just drop my stealth. So, yeah, if the pet is attached to your stealth, you have to summon a different pet. That's kind of niche, but I mean, I've had it, I've had it happen so many times. Whenever I like play a play a you know RPG, I, I go stealth, I dismiss the pet, and then I summon the same pet that is in stealth, and then I just take me and my, myself out. So that's kind of not cool to do. Also, really good BG tip. If you're defending a base, you can press meld, and then you send your pet in, and yeah, your pet, you know, it's not gonna take you out, so. Note here, you can't do intim and kill command, of course, because that'll take you out of shadow meld, but if you're a night elf, uh, you want to defend a base forever, this is kind of something that you can do as well, so yeah. Uh, useful information, that's for sure. Let's see what else do we have in my guide. Uh, oh yeah, we have death trackers, how death trackers works. So... You, the way that they buffed Death Chakrams is that they made it so that damage, like the actual damage from the Death Chakrams is now the most important thing by far. The 10% damage increase that you do is like, it's good, right? But you will mainly press Death Chakrams for the damage that it, that it gives you. So know that Death Chakrams will not bounce to targets that are in breakable CC. I mean, it will bounce to people. No, if the CC breaks instantly, it will not bounce. So as an example, if I do this freezing trap, I do that death chakrams, it will not bounce to this guy, which is kind of cool. However, if this guy is not in a freezing trap that breaks instantly, they're in something like a um, like a priest fair, maybe a root, uh, maybe a stun then it will bounce to both of them, which is really, really bad. You do not want to press death chakrams, especially in 2v2 arena where like damage is kind of like important that you do. Uh, everything matters. I see this happen so often where people stun the healer. Look here, this is cringe. I'm gonna show you a cringe thing to do right now. Don't do this. They stun the healer, they death chakrams, it bounces to fucking everyone, and then they trap. It's like, bro, just stun. Maybe do a bomb, because now it doesn't matter that the healer is thinged, because, you know, the the bomb is obviously not going to break a stun. Then trap, then press death chakrams, because now the death chakrams can only bounce to one guy, you get big damn, and then everyone is happy. Also, I see this happen every single time I play with a priest sometimes, is that since it bounces to people that are in fear, if you press death chakrams, and a priest presses fear... The death chakrams will just ignore the fear because it's a it's a CC that doesn't break insta. So the death chakrams will just break the priest fear in one second. So yeah, just be careful. 
if you can, try to always isolate the target with your death chakrams. And if you're in a scenario where the healer and the DPS are standing close to each other, never ever in your entire life to stun death chakrams trap. Always do stun, bomb because it won't break, and then trap, and then you can do the death chakrams because it only will bounce to this guy and it will not bounce to the healer. Yeah, fun fact. Also, if, if you play with a priest, don't press death chakrams. At the same time as your priest is going to fear because the death chakram is going to break the fear. Um, it's a very sad time whenever it happens, but it does happen to everyone. So yeah, keep that in mind. Very important. Knowing our intim, I think I already talk talked about this. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I did with the 50 yard range because it, do it doesn't say on, on the tooltip. But yeah, it's um definitely very cool. This I see this all the time. If you guys have wake up bound to your abilities, this is the worst thing you could ever do. Um, because look here, if I, so if you don't know what wake up is, it's the, the play dead effect. If you see, I type slash cast wake up. I have now woken my pet up. So now it will be on cooldown. So I can't wake up my pet for an additional 30 seconds. Um, yeah, there was a time where I think a guide back in the day recommended that you add wake up to all of your abilities. Because back in Shadowlands, that worked. Because wake up uh, didn't go off unless, you know, play dead has been used. But for whatever reason, this expansion, they made it so wake up is usable always. So yeah, just... Make sure that you don't have wake up to any of your spells. Just thank you. You will you will thank me later. Also, very, very important is that you can still use wake up when your pet is in CC, like a cyclone, but it will not wake them up because they're in a cyclone. Um so this is especially bad to do into a feral druid if you're trying to like pet feign death a cyclone, you mistime it. And then they, they clone your your pet while it's dead. And then you press wake up while the pet is in the clone. Because then the pet won't wake up. So now you have to wait 30 seconds to wake your pet up. <laughs> you know? You can get into some hassle. So just try to always double tap the spell. There's no macro that you can do. You just have to like just double tap your play dead button. And then it's going to work perfectly. Also keep in mind play dead it requires pet line of sight but the wake up part does not require pet line of sight so yeah this can be kind of tricky if you are in a scenario like this where you want to like pet faint up a cyclone but your pet is maybe like behind the pillar can my pet move see it won't work i need to be in line of sight yeah kind of sad but you can wake him up now whenever you want so that's something good to know uh yeah Notepad, what else do we have? Oh yeah, the flanking strikes thing. This is very, very sad. So you know how flanking strikes is like a 15 yard dash, 18 yard dash, right? Um, if your pet is rooted, let's just pretend that my pet is rooted over here, um, and I press flanking strikes, nothing will happen. Um, I will, I will use the spell. The spell will be used. But nothing will actually happen. Since flanking strikes requires your pet to not be in CC and also in line of sight of the target you want to attack for it to be used. Um, but for whatever reason, if the pet is rooted and it's also in line of sight, the flanking strikes will go off, but you won't do any damage if you are further away from, from the person. Let's say if you are melee range, let's just pretend that my pet is like sleeping or it's rooted right now. And you press flanking. This will do damage. You see how you will do the damage. But you won't get charged to the target. So just try to keep in mind. If your pet's in a route. Just never press flanking strikes. Very often that can happen. Is like you, you will just press a spell. You will not charge. You will do no damage. You will be very sad. So keep that in mind. Very cool. Also you're talking about the Camerial Trinket interaction. Yeah. So you remember how I was talking about Camerial before? Yeah. Since Scorpion Venom is a slow, and you can trinket slows, this means that if you trinket the slow, you become instantly silenced. Which means that if you do 
stun Cameriol. You cannot trinket the stun. Because you will become instantly silenced. This is how you kill Resto Tribute in the opener, Mist Weavers in the opener if you have a sub rogue on your team. This is how you kill Disc Priest in the opener because they try to like trinket PS or whatever. Yeah, very cool to surprise people in the opener. Um, to kill people with that. Keep in mind, it's a very cool mechanic. Also, keep in mind, Cameriol. If a druid presses tran uh, Tranquility when they are slowed by the Scorpion Venom, once the Spider Venom takes over, it will stop their Tranquility because they become silenced. Uh, because you can't immune the spell because it's already on you, right? I don't know. That's, that's kind of cool. Uh, good info to keep in mind. <laughs> right. So what else we have? Wild Kingdom bug? Oh yeah. The spell just doesn't really work. It's a horrendously awful spell. Um, so how it should work <laughs> is that if you have... Let me, let me show you. Oh, I'm on the wrong scene. If you have a cunning pet, it should give you a tenacity pet. If you have a tenacity pet, it should give you a cunning pet. And if you have a frosted pet, it should give you a cunning pet. Now that part works, right? It does work. You can use the Fortitude of the Bear sp stuff spell. The issue is, is that it no longer gives you the pet back. You just sit here with no pet. So how it should work is that it should just automatically summon your old pet back, back again. But it doesn't. Now this does have one good implication in Arena. And that is, it is the only way to dismiss your pet in arena. So, this means that in arena, what you can do is you can wild kingdom, wait 10 seconds, you dismiss your pet, and then you can feign death camo, summon your pet. Because now your pet is no longer in stealth, you are in stealth, and then now you can do, a, you know, now you're in this scenario, which is obviously a very, very advantage, uh, advantageous spot to be. Um, in 3s and shuffle this is fucking useless info but in 1v1 and 2v2 this is really big. It can be a game changer knowing that this piece of in information. However this means you have to go Wild Kingdom in the, in the first place which is kind of like eh. Kind of. Kind of eh. So yeah I would not really recommend it but it's good to know that it's bugged currently so you can currently do that. Why am I wargaming Billy Bobs? Um, there we go. And then I was talking about the sticky tar bomb anyway, the one with the line of sight mechanic. Yeah, you guys remember I was talking about that earlier. So yeah, that's about the that's the tips and tricks. Then number six, how to do damage. So I've been rambling for one hour seventeen minutes, and then it's like, how do you actually do damage, right? So I am going to write down. So I have an opener here, but I'm just gonna do like a, the general damage. Not talking about like opener stuff. Just okay. Let's make a new thing. Uh, damage. So here's the thing that you wanna prioritize. So this is prioritization. Is this even a correct word? I don't know. Let's check Google. <clears throat> it is a correct word. I know English. Awesome. Right. I would say number one is Wildfire Bomb. This is the most important spell in the entire game. It does a billion damage, even a trillion. So this is the highest the highest spell that I would like recommend pressing whenever it's up. If you ever have two shards of bomb available at any given time, you have done something wrong. That should never happen. Wildfire Bomb, most important spell in the entire kit. It's just super important. Because the worst thing that can happen is if you try to trap the healer and then you're given the scenario where it's like, well, I can't press a bomb because it's going to break the CC. So I, you're stuck with just pressing Mongoose Bite all day long. This is the worst thing that can ever happen. Just like, oh, just don't. Just try to always like press your bombs early so you're not given a scenario where it's like you cannot really do any damage on your go because you will break CC. This is especially if you are playing with a rogue that has a blind, or you with your own trap, or maybe a priest with a fear. Um, what can happen is that like you can't press your bomb, because if you do, you're going to break CC. So just always try to get rid of your bombs as soon as possible. Very, 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 very important. And then... Ahem. Can I like end up? Thank you. Awesome. Uh, after this, you have... Uh, like, uh, apply Serpent's thing. 
So this doesn't this does not necessarily mean that you press serpent sting, since you have two other ways of applying serpent sting. Number one, Viper's Venom. Whenever you press Morgus Bite, you have a 30% chance to apply Serpent Sting on the target. Now, this also does the application damage of Serpent Sting, which is kind of cool. So it also gives you a latent poison stack. Or, if you get the green bomb, the volatile bomb. Let's see if I can... Um, well, in a, in a bit, I will show you guys. This will throw a bomb to people, which is very, very cool. Also note... They changed it so it no longer breaks CC. Look now. This will not break the trap. Huh! Wow, volatile reaction doesn't break traps anymore. God damn, this is the thing where it's like it does AoE damage around people that have Serpent Sting. So just know that it will not break CC, it will not bounce. So you don't have to worry about this breaking CC anymore. Very, very cool. I'm a very happy fan. Next up. After you have applied Serpent Sting, you. Kinda just wanna press Mongoose Bite. Yeah, kinda just want to press Mongoose Bite. That's about it. Um, yeah, just press Mongoose Bite. And then, number four, whenever you need focus, press Kill Command, right? Yeah, this is the core rotation. There's like nothing here that is like super out of the world, super crazy, whatever. It's just, this is just how you do shit. It's just, yeah, it's just, you know, without taking in, into consideration, like, explosive shot, death chakrams, flanking strikes, fury of the eagle, corridor assault, kill shot windows, you know, without taking into any consideration of that, this is just baseline core rotation. Very cool. Do this and you're fine, right? Then... Whenever you do want to press core in, uh, with coordinated assault, coordinated assault. So here you get a buff from your pet claw, which is this dish spell over here. Uh, the claw. Whenever this happens on your coordinated assault, you will get a buff that will empower your next bomb and your kill shot. If you can read the tooltip over here. So with this buff available, you always want to press it on kill shot. It is the biggest value that you can ever do. So if I press coordinated assault. See, I will get this buff. It will, uh, yeah, apply bleeding gash to my target. If you can always do your kill shot with this buff available, because then it will do 50% more damage. Since the bleeding gash is just 50% of the kill shot damage gets converted into a bleed. So always try to do your kill shot with the bleeding gash. Now, are you going to go to prison if you press kill shot without the buff? Maybe. Just know that, like, of course there are some scenarios, some scenarios where you can press kill shot without the buff, but just try your hardest to prioritize kill shot with the buff. Because that's kind of where your damage is coming from with coordinated assault. Since it only really gives you CDR on your bomb, and it gives you the ability to press kill shot. That's the only thing that it does. It doesn't give you, like, wings... Where it's like, oh, 20% damage, 20% crit, 20% crit damage, or, or night, I, I don't know, like combustion, where it gives you like 100% crit. Like, you don't have that. It just allows you to press kill shot and CDR on your bomb. That's about it. So, just try to press kill shot whenever you get the buff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, when do you actually press coordinate assault? I guess the answer is like, usually in, in the opener. But the harder, longer, more boring question is, it will depend on the scenario. So if you're in, in a game where if you press coordinate assault, the fact that you are in melee range will make it so you'll die. Well, that's a bad coordinate assault, right? You don't, you don't, you, you don't want to die whenever you press the spell. So then you maybe want to wait on the second trap. Because usually what will happen in the opener in shuffles and threes and twos uh, twos is different, actually. Let's just say, like, threes and uh, shuffle. Normally, what would happen is that the enemy team will press all of their offensive series in the opener. So then, if you press coordinate assault in the opener, you will now be in melee range, which is kind of bad, because then you will just die. So, usually, it's better to press coordinate assault second go in shuffle, for the most part, because then... They have already gotten the defensive CDs from your teammate in the opener since you didn't die. So you are allowed to just be melee range, 
press kill shot, do everything, yada yada, blah blah blah, and live and be fine. Now, this obviously doesn't mean that like you can't do it all the time, but for the most part, I think Corrin Assault is better to use second go, which means for first go, you can use Eagle and use the damage with Monkey's points from, from a distance. So, yeah. And then, of course, speaking about openers, I think that's the next one that I have to talk about. Exactly, openers. Here are the openers that I would recommend. There's a lot of a lot of words here, um, but yeah. So the core rotation, and also I have to do this on my other character, because yeah, I don't have four set on this character. So uh, BRB, I'll be back. Hello team, I am back. So. I'm just going to be talking about the opener and your four set right now. So if you don't know what the four set is, is that whenever you press Fury of the Eagle, you throw a bomb on someone. So just know that this tooltip is actually bugged in PvP sometimes. Um, you have the potential that sometimes it says current target at 50% effectiveness. But just note that that's a bug. It will throw a bomb that will do the same damage as any other bomb. And then you will do 20% more damage to the target with bomb damage, and also you get 7% crit, 7% crit damage. So one thing as well about this is the fact that it's only the first tick of Fury of the Eagle that has a chance to trigger this. So if you, if you see here, I threw a bomb on this guy because the first tick of Fury of the Eagle did the thing. So I'm going to show you what happens if you don't do it. So here, right, this is gonna, this is gonna, this is um, going to be really bad to do. If you press Fury of the Eagle, and then you walk up, you see how I won't get the free bomb. So that is really bad to do. You always, always, always want to press Fury of the Eagle and then make sure that the first bomb always connects, okay? Very, very important. Something else to keep in mind is that the free bomb that you get will always be a different bomb from the bomb that you have available. So in this example right now, um, if I press Fury of the Eagle, I can only throw a red bomb or a blue bomb. And if you get a green bomb, this bomb will change. So you cannot do a double bomb like that, which is really, really good. So if you see here, if you have the eagle, I got green bomb, you see? But this changes to a red bomb. So yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. That's kind of sick. So you know for a fact that you can always do Fear of, of the Eagle followed up with a bomb and you will never have the same bomb effect overlapping. So that is really, really cool. Good to know. Um, so yeah. But how do you actually do damage with this though, right? So here will be the the core murder maneuver right now. You know, I'm just gonna do it on this guy so the Death Chakram doesn't bounce. So you wanna do Explosive Shot, then Death Chakrams, then Fury of the Eagle, Bomb, Flanking, Bomb. That is like the most damage that you can do ever. And it looks like this. So you do explosive shot, death chakrams, fear of the eagle, bomb, flanking, bomb. See I did like a trillion billion damage per second. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Now you might say, oh my god, but uh, you have you had too many bombs, Bismix. Oh, oh my god, when did you press when did you press coronet assault here? Uh, what what about Camerial here? Uh, what, what what about stun trap? Yeah, that's kind of the issue. Can I drop combat, please? Thank you. All right, cool. So here is an example of doing CC, where you can do... I can show you here, actually. Let's say this is the healer. So you can do explosive shot on this guy, then stun the healer, then death chakrams, then trap the healer, and then same thing, fear of the eagle, bomb flanking bomb. So that would look like this, where you can do explosive, stun the healer, death chakrams, trap, Fury of the Eagle, bomb, flanking, bomb. So here you kind of get like everything done at the same time while you are also seizing the healer, which is kind of cool. Now, one thing you might have noticed is like, oh my god, but what if they're really far away and you can't get the Fury of the Eagle off? What should I do then? Well, here, either you can do the um, explosive shot, stun the healer, death chakrams, trap the healer, then you can go in for a harpoon, Fury of the Eagle. That is something that is like kind of good to do. You can do it. Just make sure that you don't press Fury of the Eagle while you are inside the air and you wait until you actually land on the target. But I think an opener that I prefer to do for the most part, usually, 
is the Camerial opener. And as a note, whenever you're doing this, you can try to like squeeze some damage beforehand. Um, because usually in Shuffle, it's not really worth it to just CC Insta. It's basically better for the most part to always try to, um, you know, get some damage rolling before you actually stomp trap the healer. Which is why I think trapping from stealth is kind of bad. Because you haven't had any time to set up your damage. Your team it hasn't had any time to set up your damage. Usually by the time the CC is over, if you trap healer from self, the kill target is going to be at like 80% HP. I, to me, it's kind of pointless in shuffle. But obviously in coordinated twos and threes, it's very, very different. So this is the opener that I usually do in shuffle. I will do Chameleon on the healer into a bomb on the kill target and then kill command. Then explosive shot as the silence connects. Then you can do death chakrams on the kill target. And then here, if you stun trap, you don't have to harpoon back um, or flanking strikes back to get the fury of the eagle off because you were, you know, you'll be melee range at that time. Um, but if you harpoon trap the healer, which is usually good into something like a disc priest or maybe like a resto druid, because here's the thing, right? If you do chameleon harpoon trap, that means that second go you can stun trap. Because if you do Camerial and Stun and Trap, the second trap can be kind of hard to get because you don't have Camerial or Stun to help you get it in the first place. Do you know what I mean? So, an opener that I would recommend, let's say they are kind of far away. I'm going to pretend that this is the healer. So then something that you can do is Camerial, Explosive Shot, Death Chakram's here, into a thing, Bomb... Oh my god, what am I doing? Okay, I'm gonna restart because I kind of spaced out. Never mind, I should read my script. Okay, hi, I'm back. I straight up just forgot what I was doing. Okay, so here's the opener that I usually try <laughs> usually try to do. Is you silence the healer. Then you can do a bomb, kill command, explosive on this. Then death chakrams. And then you can pet stun. And then you can do a bomb. And then you can trap. And then harpoon, coronet assault. And uh, fear of the eagle. And then you can maybe do a flanking off. And then over here you can just press bomb. And then you can kill the people like that. And then same thing again, if you can't do the stun trap, but you just want to do like a harpoon trap instead, you can then maybe just press like coordinate assault to get into melee range in the first place. Um to get the fury of the eagle off, and then you can do maybe do like a kill shot off. So I'll I'll show you how that how that works. Okay, I swear, this is why people have like uh, video editing software, because it's so easy to just space out as you're showing something. Okay, this is why I Dude, the way that I'm doing it, I just have my OBS and I'm clicking stop record and then I just... Dude, this is so scuffed, but it's fine. Okay, so <clears throat> here I'm going to show you the harpoon variant where you don't press pet stun because you want to save it for next go. So then there will be Camero, this guy, and you can do bomb and you can kill command, explosive on this, and then harpoon trap, disengage in, death chakrams, fear of the eagle, bomb, flanking, bomb. So here either you can disengage in to get into melee range for the Fury of the Eagle, or you can press coordinate assault. Here I just did disengage because I felt that this was way more natural. This is like actually what I do in like a real game. Um, but of course you can, depending on how far away you might have to like disengage and do coordinate coordinate assault. So okay, now I will actually do <laughs> the coordinate assault opener, I swear, okay? Hey guys, I'm officially back. Also, one thing that I didn't notice, if you have coordinate assault, instead of doing Fury of the Eagle, bomb flanking bomb, usually it's better to do coordinate assault um, after the, you know, you press coordinate assault, Fury of the Eagle, bomb, kill shot, flanking bomb. So, I'll show you here. So you want to do uh, Camerial, bomb, kill command this guy, explosive shot, harpoon trap, Coordinate Assault, into flanking, into this button here, this button, this, and then this, and then you bomb again. Dude, I have it, everything here. It's so hard to do the globals and say it at the same time. But yeah, you can look over here um, on all the globals that I that I pressed. Technically, if you want to mid-max it, it would have been better if I did Fury of the Eagle bomb kill shot flanking, because you get to see it a little bit earlier, but this is like one global mistake, okay? I mean, we're all human, right? I make mistakes too, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll try to do one time for the one time, let's see if I can do the mathematical best rotation if you want to press coordinate assault in the opener, which I wouldn't even recommend doing in the first place, but I'm just going to show it right now because I fucked it up three times in a row. So I'm going to do it one time for the one time. 
Okay, hi, we are back. Let's see if I can not be spaced out. So let's see if I can do the rotation while saying it at the exact same time. <coughs> if only I had some video editing software, this would have been a lot easier to make, but it's fine. Camille, this guy. Bomb, kill command, explosive, harpoon, death chakrams, trap, coordinate assault, fear of the eagle, bomb, kill shot, flanking, bomb. Ta-da! And there it is. I feel like it's mathematically not possible to do more damage in the opener while also CCing the healer for a very long time. So this would be the opener that I would recommend if you are trying to... Well, first off, if you, if you know that you won't get CC'd in the opener, because obviously if you get CC'd at one point, you have to like do something else. But also this also means that you have pet stun trap for next go. It also means that you can press coordinate assault this go. So there's a lot of different variations you can do. You can also do the explosive... Death chakrams, stun the healer, or maybe do like stun the healer, and then you can do the explosive with this guy if you know it won't break, trap the healer, and then just do something like a death chakrams, flanking strikes in to get melee range, then you can do the fear of the eagle bomb into maybe like a bomb again, you know, like there are so many different combinations that you guys can do, but the ultimate thing to just keep in mind is try to throw your bombs, and then try to just press fury of the eagle, Followed up by a bomb. That is the most important thing by far. Also, if you have a question about like, oh, do I cancel Fury of the Eagle or do I do I let it do I let it, you know, th go out through the entire thing? That will just depend on the on the scenario. Sometimes it's better to just cancel it by press pressing bomb afterwards, or you can just let it sit the entire thing and then press bomb afterwards. It depends if you want to get the damage out right away or if you wanna care more about the the longevity of everything. So yeah, basically when it comes to doing damage on Survivor Hunter, it's as long as you follow the, the guidelines of knowing explosive then death chakrams, and then after this you can follow follow it up with like a Fury of the Eagle bomb planking bomb. There are so many different ways you can go about this. And I haven't even touched on doing things like, I don't know, pressing Eagle in the opener, because maybe you can't be melee ranged in the opener. Because then you're kind of just stuck to doing something like, I don't know, Maybe explosive shot, stun, death chakrams, bomb, trap, press fear of the eagle, and then you won't get by from range. Like this is this is a very common opener that you can do almost every single time. And then maybe you can, you know, just do a random piss go, just like Camero the healer, flank his rocks in, fear of the eagle, bomb, bomb. And then, you know, you get some damage out while the healer is in, in a silence, you know? Like, you can always do that. It doesn't have to be super scripted as well. You can, there's so many different ways you can do damage on survival. So, just try to follow the, the guidelines. Try to prior bomb. Try to always get explosive shot and death chakrams on kill ghosts. Don't just throw them out randomly. They're very, 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 very important spells. Don't just throw these out into the ocean. Both explosive and death chakrams. You can't throw them in, in the ocean. Same thing with Fury of the Eagle. Everything else you can kind of throw whenever you want. You can press bomb whenever you want. You can kind of flank strikes whenever you want. You can kind of coordinate it whenever you want. Kind of-ish. Not really, but kind of. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. And then if you're ever thinking about like, Hey, Bismax, what about Spearhead? Do I ever, do, do I ever add this into my burst rotation? Um, no, you don't. This is a, mo this is a mobility spell. Yeah, that's that's the use case of that. Uh, I'm just going to log over my main, see if there's anything that I missed. Wait one sec. It seems like that is a no. I kind of went over everything that I really wanted to go over. Um, I'm sure there's something that I missed. Um, also, I'll make more guides in the future talking about like more specific things in-game. Um, so I didn't have any in-game examples here. So... Yeah, I know that I say this all the time. I have been very lazy when it comes to uploading things on YouTube, but I kind of want to start uploading things again. So, yeah, if there's anything specific you want to know, like maybe, oh my god, what do I do into casters? Or what do I do into melee? Or oh, how do I counter Demon Hunter? Or blah, 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 you know? If you have any question, just feel free to put it down in the comment section down below. I'll try my best to, to answer it. Or if you maybe want to see... Um, maybe like, okay, I was thinking about doing this, right? If any one of y'all wanted to send me a, um, uh, like, a video 
for me to VOD review and just do it on YouTube. I think that could be kind of fun. Me just doing like a VOD review on YouTube so you guys can see like the thought process that I go through whenever I do VOD reviews. Um, and also you can obviously learn something from like other people's mistakes. So yeah, if there's anything that you guys want to see, um, feel free to give me some ideas because like, I kind of want to post stuff. So yeah, but uh, thank you guys for watching. Hope you had fun, hope you learned something. Um, that'll be the guide. I Okay, take care. Love you guys. Peace out. Bye-bye.